When I was little, my dad was convinced that I had an abnormally small head. He worried about a potential lack of gray matter and the consequences for said lack of gray matter down the line. In fact, my family began to call me Chotomuk Munka, with Chotomuk Munk meaning small face in Bengali and Munka being my family's nickname for me. But when I was about two, my dad began to realize that he'd been worrying about the wrong kid. That's when my twin brother, Rohan, was diagnosed with autism. Now, autism is a spectrum, which means that it looks different for everyone. For Rohan, it has looked like not being able to communicate using spoken language and having a cognitive age of about a two-year-old or a tenth of our chronological age. He's had to work intensively with speech, behavioral, and occupational therapists to learn things that we take for granted, like brushing his teeth, putting on his clothes, and communicating his basic needs using modified sign language. He is our family's perpetual toddler, a five foot ten one at that, and he brings with him a variety of challenges and joys. But what that looked for me was that my childhood looked different from a lot of my friends' childhoods. Even though I wasn't embarrassed of him, I hesitated to have playdates at my own house for fear of his unpredictable 30 minute meltdown. A lot of typical family outings were also inaccessible to us. Things like eating out or going to the movies because of his potentially disruptive behaviors. I would get to eat out sometimes with my friends or my mom or dad individually, but it was never lost on me that Rohan did not share that same privilege. That is, until one day, when we were 17, the unthinkable happened, and my entire family shared a meal inside a restaurant. It was a perfectly ordinary Indian restaurant, but as, as I looked around the table, I teared up, realizing what an extraordinary accomplishment this was for us. And my responsibilities growing up also looked a little bit different than the typical household chore. Even though I was the younger twin by a full minute, I assumed the role of older sister. I was charged with keeping him safe and out of trouble whether we were at home or out. My parents also included me in a lot of grown-up conversations. They would ask me for my opinion on his therapy goals and also ask me to proofread emails to insurance case managers and teachers. Generally, I grew up bearing witness to and being part of issues and discussions that a lot of kids my age didn't need to think about. The best example of this is the matter of who will take care of Rohan when my parents no longer can. Really quickly, I just want you to think of who comes to your mind when you think of someone with a developmental disability. I'm willing to bet that a lot of you are envisioning a child. And that's because society often forgets that children with these disabilities grow into adults with these disabilities, but as parents age, external supports like school programs drop off, leaving them scrambling to find care for their adult children. And in the case that they have a neurotypical sibling, that role often ends up falling to them. Even though my parents never had an explicit conversation with me about that future, I've carried that implicit sense of responsibility within me probably since I was about eight. Because if not me, then who? When I was 18, I signed papers agreeing to be his standby guardian if anything were to happen to my parents. So, you can imagine that growing up in my family meant growing up quick. And the most common compliment I would get from kindergarten to high school teachers is how mature I was for my age. And I took that as a, I took that as a compliment, a good thing, the gold star for being the unproblematic child. But I realize now that it was also a sign of loneliness. Just a quick show of hands, how many of you here have siblings? All right, so a lot of you. So you guys know that siblingship is built on camaraderie. But a twin, they're meant to be your built-in best friend. So how do I explain that the person meant to fulfill that role, my twin brother, will never even be able to have a conversation with me? Who could understand that at high school graduation, I kept looking at the seat next to me, knowing that he should have been there and wishing that he was? 
Sometimes I see my roommate texting with her brother about some ridiculous Facebook post that their dad sent them. And how do I justify my feelings of jealousy about that simple exchange and how deeply I wish I could have that? Growing up, I never had anyone I could talk to about those complex emotions, and I noticed that my parents didn't really either. They rarely told anyone about their struggles with parenting us. When I asked my mother one day why, she told me, what's the point? They probably wouldn't understand, and we don't want their pity. Pity. It's a bitter word that often tinges conversations if we mention Rohan's diagnosis. There's a really thin line between empathy and pity, and it's somewhat human for us to veer into the latter when we don't share someone's experience. It wasn't until late into the pandemic, I was doing college from home and watching my brother, that I began to think about siblings in similar families to mine, because they had to be out there. And a Google search that I had somehow never thought to do before led me to a Facebook group called SibNet. This was a group of 5,000 siblings from all across the world, and there was even a subgroup called Sib20 for siblings like me in their 20s. The first night that I found those groups, I scrolled, and I scrolled, and I scrolled. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. This was a group with siblings, with brothers and sisters with different abilities and disabilities. Siblings who were primary caregivers, and siblings who were estranged from their families, and everything in between. But more importantly, these were people who got it. They got the growing up quickly, and they got the fearing for our siblings' futures. I rarely posted myself, but on hard days, I just scrolled, and I was bound to find someone who had gone through or was going through something similar. Commiseration even through a virtual platform, was shockingly therapeutic. I was so grateful to have found this community that I wanted to give back, I wanted to contribute, and as a writer, my first instinct was to share our stories. But something about taking someone else's story and rendering it into my own words felt too indirect. So instead, I worked to provide a platform where siblings could share their own stories with their own voices, a podcast. Now, when the idea first popped into my head, the logical part of my brain screamed at me. You've never edited audio before in your life, and just because you like listening to podcasts doesn't mean you'll be a good host for one. All valid points, but for once, I didn't listen to that logical part of my brain, and instead, I drew up a Google form and I posted it to SIBNAT to gauge interest, and 60 members filled it out. The next thing I knew, I was getting funding from Hopkins, and I was off. I was contacting interested siblings, recording an intro and outro, and trying to figure out which microphone and software setup would be best to use. So that's how The Secret Life of Sibs came about. To date, I've hosted eight episodes with eight incredible guests. We've reached over 500 unique individuals and almost 700 downloads. And those numbers are great. But what really sticks with me is the response that I've gotten from other siblings. After I posted the sixth episode, a woman who was a primary caregiver for her younger brother emailed me. And she wrote, I cried listening to each episode because I never thought I could connect so deeply to strangers. That is the power of feeling seen and feeling heard. That is the power of finding people who get it. When I have guests on to the show at the end of each episode, I ask them two of the same questions. One is what's one piece of advice they give to other sibs, and two, what is one thing they want others to know about their lived experience? To that latter question, I get the same answer over and over. I want others to know how isolating it is. Now, I want others to know that those seemingly isolating experiences don't have to feel that way. I know that there's no lonelier feeling than trying to communicate some part of yourself to someone who can give you pity at worst and empathy at best. But in this day and age, we have an advantage. 
we're so interconnected that we're, we have people like us at the tips of our fingers. I mean, all it took for me was a Google search and a Facebook account. All we have to do is look. So today, I still carry that same sense of responsibility and fear for the future that I've had since I was a little kid. But now, I know that there's others out there feeling those same feelings and fighting the same battle. Somewhere out there, someone has already weathered the storm and come out of it. And when it feels like we can't do the same, it's imperative that we look to them and find others to endure alongside. I urge you to do the same. If you ever find yourself enduring alone, I promise there are people out there who get it. You just have to look. I know that now, and things don't feel as lonely anymore. And me and my small head think Rohan and I will be just fine. Thank you.